This week's blog post is the third in my series on the James Museum of Western and Wildlife Art in St. Petersburg, Florida. In the last two weeks, we looked at the architecture of the James and sculptures on the entrance level and the second floor. This week, we look at a few of the many paintings on the second floor. For more on the James, see the first post in this series. This is Billy Shank's A Mirror Image of an Imperfect World from 2000. In a nod to pop art, Schenk chooses not to blend his colors in this painting of Cedar Mesa in southeastern Utah. Not surprisingly, Schenk also does serographs, silk screen images, which require the same sort of separation of colors. I've given you a link to more of his works. Incidentally, one of the reasons I enjoy the artworks at the James is that Tom and Mary James seem to have a fondness for the same colors and color combinations that I do here for the oranges and yellows and purples. This is Kurt Walter's A Sense of Time from 2006. It's a view of the Grand Canyon. Some of the landscapes at the James remind me of Albert Bierstadt's in their sweeping views, their lighting, and their precise detail. That's quite a compliment. Of course, Bierstadt never saw this dizzying point of view because he had no airplanes or drones or balloons. This is Herman Adams First Marble Canyon Music, 2004. It shows the head of the Grand Canyon. Adam says the waterfalls of the area remind him of music, hence the painting's title. And I've given you a link to more of his works. This is John Cogan's Eventide, 2014. Another Grand Canyon scene. In this one, I like the contrast between the striations of the limestone and the fluffy, swooping clouds. This painting and the ones I just showed you are quite large, and I've tried to give you a sense by including the frame, because you don't see this kind of detail on a 6 by 6 inch painting, but they really do deserve to be seen in person. This one is Dan Naminga's Polaka Evening, 2009, an extraordinarily vivid sunset behind the mesas of Arizona. It's like a Mark Rothko painting that actually has content. You can go look up Mark Rothko, I don't need to include him. I've given you a link to more of this artist's works as well. This is William Herbert, a.k.a. Buck Dunton's Prairie Courtship, circa 1910. It's one of the earlier works at the James, and it's by an illustrator. This was for a published book or short story. I'm just making the point that not all the works at the James are very, very recent. And I've given you a link to more of Dunton, Dunton's works as well. This one is Songs of the Night, 2016, by John Coleman. Coleman is best known as a sculptor. In the previous two posts on the James, we've seen several of his bronzes based on the Catlin Bogmer paintings of Indians. This is one of them. In this painting, he experiments with firelight. Quite a lot of the paintings at the James are by artists who like to play with sunrise, sunset, fire, and other subtle changes in light. I've given you a link again to Coleman's site. Robert Duncan, Hard Times for Travel, 2011. As a farmer's daughter, I tend to think in very concrete terms about getting back to nature, struggling through the snow, on foot and on horseback, wearing leather clothing. Seems like Western civilization does offer something better than that. This is Ray Swanson, Want to Share the Fry Bread, from 1994. An absolutely charming child. Here's the background on fry bread. During the long walk of 1864 to 66, the Navajo were forced to move several hundred miles from Arizona to New Mexico. Fry bread became a staple of their diet. It was made of the white flour, processed sugar, and lard that the army issued as rations. I've given you a link to more of Swanson's works. Dan Meaduk, Prometheus's Children, 2012. The Plains Indians used to set the grass on fire to drive bison to areas where they were more easily hunted. This painting made the cut for this post due to its combination of colors and light. Many of Miduk's other paintings have the same combination of colors and light. This is Andy Thomas, Oklahoma Land Rush 2015. I could not figure out at first glance, before I got close enough to read the label, what was going on here. According to the label, at noon on April 22, 1889, almost 2 million acres of land, 
formerly held by Indians, was opened to settlement. An estimated 50,000 people competed for it, which tells you something about the desirability of farmland and grazing land in the late 19th century. By the end of the day, Oklahoma City had been established and had 10,000 residents. I've given you a link to more of Thomas's works. And finally, another by Billy Schenck. The first one in the post was by him as well. Oh, you wanted to see my guns, 1991. Schenck enjoys playing on Western stereotypes, and here he celebrates the glamorous cowgirl. I've given you a link to more of his works. Next week, we will look at a few of the wildlife paintings and sculptures at the James. DianeDrantyWriter.com has hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, architecture, and my other obsessions. To join the free Sunday Recommendations email list, visit the URL that's on the screen or email me. And you can say, well done, Diane, or support my work and receive rewards by the tip jar on DianeDrantyWriter.com. As always, thank you for listening.